Let me get started. So uh, uh, by my clock, it's uh, just a little bit after 12:30 Eastern. So we'll go ahead and get uh, get going. My name is John Mann, and I am an assistant professor here at Michigan State University, and I work with the North Central Regional Center for Rural Development and host a webinar series called Innovations in Agriculture and Rural Development. So uh, welcome everybody to today's webinar. The, uh, the topic, our title is uh, Pan Genome Systems, uh, Developing a Novel and Effective Vaccine for uh, Yonas Disease. Uh, before we get started with the actual presentation, I just want to uh, make a couple of notes. Uh, first of all, we've got a poll up. So if you haven't done so, uh, please take a moment and, and uh, fill that out. Uh, about halfway through the presentation, we're going to take a quick 20-second uh, pause. Um, and at that point in time, we're going to ask you uh, the participants a couple of uh, uh, trivia questions um, and it's really to uh, encourage a little bit of audience participation in what we're doing and to help you start thinking about you know your potential questions um, at the conclusion of the presentation we'll do the uh, question and answer session so towards the bottom of the uh, of the screen you'll see a chat box so feel free as we're going forward to go ahead and type your uh, questions in and then we'll get to those at the conclusion of the presentation and then once we wrap up with the question and answer session, we're going to have a, a really short poll, just three questions. And so I hope you will stick around with that or for that. Um, next, we're going to have a, a couple of screen flashes. So I'm going to demonstrate one now. And then we'll, uh, I'll hand this off and we'll get started with the presentation. So we'll give the screen just a moment to load. And this will be our uh, PowerPoint presentation. So again, I want to thank everybody for participating. And now, uh, John Sandbrook and Dr. Uh, Adel uh, Talat is going to tell us a little bit more about pangenome systems and their effort uh, in developing a vaccine for uh, Yonas disease. So uh, John, go ahead. Great. Thanks, John. Um, and first, I want to welcome everyone and uh, thank, thank you all for being part of the webinar. Um, it's great to see so many folks showing at least some interest in, in solving the big problems in our industry. Uh, and Yoni's disease is definitely one of those. Um, but also it's great to be in the environment where we're uh, applying some of the world-class world research being done in this country's uh, research institutions, including Michigan State University and the University of Wisconsin, which is closer to us. Uh, and countless others as well. John, John, I'm um, sorry. Pardon my disruption. I want to give you. Um, we've got some feedback with you. John. We've got some feedback coming in through uh, through Edel's uh, uh, mic. Um, I'm sorry. Excuse me. The disruption. I want to try to fix that real quick because I can hear your hear some feedback. Sure. I apologize for the sure, disruption. Give me a second. Yeah. Is that any better? Much much Is better. That, Go ahead. That, I apologize. That the problem there, John. Okay, great. Sorry. Sorry, folks. Thanks for bearing with us. There's always a few of those uh, technical things to sort out. Um, so I want to introduce you to uh, Pangenome Systems. Uh, that's our company here. We're uh, an animal health vaccine company uh, based in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, and with me today, I have uh, Dr. Adel Talat, who's the founder and CEO of Pangenome Systems. And uh, he'll be able to give you uh, some of the scientific background and, and the research we've uh, been doing that's led us to where we are today. Uh, and obviously, my name's John Sandbrook. I'm the president of the company. Uh, and I'll be running through some of the, uh, the, the business and commercialization side of that equation today. So I really want to just give you a, a high level start overview of what to expect out of the webinar today uh, really three parts the first is I want to outline the problem that uh, we're trying to solve uh, second I want to talk I want you to understand a little about our solution to that problem and then thirdly really just running through uh, the commercialization activities and uh, how it's worked for us what's happened when and why and some of our plans for the future so with that, I want to uh, pass over to uh, Dr. Talat. And uh, Dr. Talat is a premier researcher in this area, uh, internationally recognized as a Yoni's disease uh, expert. He's been working in this field for 20 odd years. Uh, so he's long suffering trying to solve this problem. Um, and he's really the, the brains behind the technology that Pangenome Systems is putting into place. So uh, I want to introduce him uh, now and we can get moving on some of the science stuff. So with that, Dr. Talat, all yours. All right. 
I think we will have to mute your uh, microphone here. I, um, my name is uh, Adel Talat. I'm a professor of microbiology in the Vitt School in, in Madison, Wisconsin. I'm also co-founder of uh, Yoni's Disease uh, Company, company who is uh, trying to solve the problem of Yoni's Disease and uh, basically solve this problem once and for all. Uh, but before we can uh, talk about this um, and uh, talk about our solution for uh, uh, UNS disease, I, I would love to have the next slide, please. Do I have control of this? I, I did, but... Uh, okay. So, typically when you look at the, a dairy cow or a dairy herd, you usually see healthy animals. And this will be like one of these funny pics that we uh, that present there out there for uh, happy cows and uh, how they should look like. And next slide, you can see the completely unhappy cow, which is the reverse of the first slide, where we see an animal suffer from uh, chronic diarrhea and weight loss, and definitely a significant drop in uh, in milk uh, uh, production. And as you can see here. This is a picture uh, we adopted from uh, our dear uh, UNS Disease Testing Center in uh, University of Wisconsin uh, Madison. Uh, a very important uh, uh, lab for control for helping the diagnosis of UNS disease here, run by Dr. Mike Collins. But uh, the work of Mike Collins and others identified UNS disease as a big problem long time ago, from the 90s and uh, 2000s and, and so forth. But uh, actually, if you look at the actual prevalence data, you see that uh, in the 90s, we were talking about 40% of the dairy herds. And I want to make a distinction here. When I, say, when I say dairy herd, means that if you have one animal infected in this herd, we call it a, a, a herd is positive. So we say 40% in, in the 90s. Uh, were infected with or have this problem of uh, urinary disease uh, goes through the 2000 and even the first uh, 10 years of uh, to, uh, of the new millennium and you see that urinary disease is creeping up and going up to latest estimate up to 91 percent in the United States uh, which means like 90 percent of the dairy herds you have a problem of urinary disease which makes this problem even worse that our detection methods are not really uh, optimal and the diagnosis of UNIS disease is uh, problematic. Uh, lots of time we count an ELISA and this ELISA is good only in 50% to 50 to 60% of the cases, which means that you have an underestimation of the presence of the problem in your herd. So if you see uh, some folks uh, estimated that if you see one positive animal, this means you have at least 20 that they are not uh, either, either did not turn out uh, to be positive yet, or they are positive but you really cannot detect uh, with the current technology. And the underlying problem behind all of this problem with diagnosis and the control of the disease, the disease itself is um, a chronic disease and can take a long time to develop. Animals usually infected early on in their life, in the first few days of life, during uh, milking for uh, contaminated milk or getting licking some feces from from the mother which been uh, infected with microbacterium paratuberculosis. And then take a few years, a couple of years, three years, even four or five years before you can see the first signs of the disease. So it's a really hard disease to control, hard disease to manage, hard disease to detect because during these five years while the mycobacteria is in hiatus, you are not able to get to see shedding of mycobacteria in the feces. Uh, when you do blood tests, usually it, it will turn out to be negative for all the animals infected because there is no human immune response yet. So this uh, scenario uh, makes the cost of uh, this disease is very high. And again, with the increase of prevalence in, in health, you have also increase of the estimated cost uh, from uh, 200 million uh, per year for the United States alone 
up to 500 and more in 2014. So this is definitely a uh, bad disease to have and also um, very uh, challenging for veterinarian and for, and for uh, veterinary authorities to control. So we, I think I touched in all of this information while I'm talking about this, uh, this uh, bad looking cow. Uh, but the most important thing is the losses coming from the loss of the milk yield, number one, and also low level of mortality, because you will see animals dying now and then from infected herd. It's definitely when you see this animal's is emaciation and chronic diarrhea, they eventually end to uh, uh, die. But the worst thing also about this uh, chronic diarrhea, diarrhea and the animals that they are infected, that they don't just contain the infection, but also they make as a good tool for spreading the infection to new animals. It's been estimated that each uh, gram of, uh, fecal t of feces can have up to 10 to the 6, 10 to the 8, depends on the shedding level of mycobacteria in, in animals. And this can definitely spread the infection. It takes only, according to some estimates, about uh, a thousand organisms in order to, to get infected. So you have a, an animal which every gram of their feces have about uh, a million uh, bacteria. And then you only need a thousand bacteria to infect a new animal. You can imagine over time and over years that one animal can infect the rest of the herd very easily. And that's the, uh, the main problem about this disease, not just bad for itself, but also bad for spreading the infection and very efficient in spreading the infection to new animals. So that's definitely something that we need to be aware about and something that we, uh, we've been working to, to solve. And uh, uh, there is always this wisdom saying if there is a need, there will be a way. And I've been working on the field of mycobacteria, as John said, for over 20 years. My background in uh, working on mycobacterium in fish and mycobacterium tuberculosis in human. I was using the fish model as a, as a model for human tuberculosis. But then 10 years ago, when I moved to uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and realized that I'm in a dairy state where uh, dairy animals contribute significantly to uh, the economy of the state, and I imagine it's the same also for uh, Michigan and so many other states in the Midwest, and definitely in California in the West, realized this is a huge problem and really deserves some more attention. And uh, just to give you, to make the long story short, uh, my lab is specialized or working on genetics of mycobacteria and trying to basically decipher the genomes of uh, mycobacteria in order to get useful products. And by useful products here I mean a vaccine or drug therapy. And in terms of animal health and in terms of unis diseases specifically, we are talking about a vaccine. Because vaccination uh, is only valid uh, intervention that we can do beside control, uh, beside uh, normal control measures in order to uh, reduce the problem of Yonis disease. And if you look at the field of vaccines, you will see that you have so many ways you can make a vaccine, you have so many ways you can immunize uh, animals in order to elicit a strong immune response and able to uh, control the infection within the animal. But um, if just in a snapshot here, I am just showing a slide with uh, leading technologies for developing vaccines. And definitely each one of these technologies have its own advantage and disadvantage, including the ones that we are using. We are using the live attenuated vaccine platform. It's based on the work in my lab, identifying uh, genes important for uh, virulence and pathogenicity of this organism. And when we knocked out the genes, we were able to uh, generate a mutant. This mutant is mimic is a wild type strain in everything except in its virulence. So it's not able to cause a disease 
in the same level like the wild type strain. But this labyrinth strain can still produce the whole gamut of immune responses. And I definitely don't want to go in details knowing the audience have diverse background here about the kind of immune responses. But if you look at the slide, you will see that if you are using inactivated vaccine or you get a bacteria and and kill it with formalin or with heat treatment, you will elicit certain parts of the immune system. When you use a recombinant vector, which means that you're getting uh, uh, specific antigens that they can elicit immune response and they can protect against the infection, although this is a very neat and cute idea, but the problem that you're only uh, triggering uh, immune response from certain, from certain parts of the immune system are not able to elicit the whole gamut of immune responses. While the life attenuated strains definitely can elicit a very close immune response to the uh, wild type infection. But also, as I told you, everything comes with its advantages and disadvantages. One of the disadvantages of the life attenuated strain, actually a couple of them, the first that um, this strain, if it's not well controlled and if uh, it's not well designed, that's what I mean, if it's not well designed, it can revert to the virulence phenotype. And instead of vaccinating, you're actually infecting animal. So that's, that's an important concern. The other concern is that come to mind here that this life attenuated strain, once you vaccinate with it, uh, you using the current technologies for vaccines, you will not, uh, or for diagnostics, you will not be able to identify the differences between infected and vaccinated animals. So, we have seen that there is an opportunity here for us uh, where uh, we have uh, candidate mutants that they can help with, uh, uh, with, with controlling the unis disease and use them as a live attenuated strain against uh, UNIS, but also we realize that challenges and that we are doing right now in order to uh, control this or work on these challenges in order to make this vaccine um, a very uh, good vaccine. Let me just go through the current vaccine technologies because that's uh, definitely uh, an important comparison to our vaccine. Uh, our, the current vaccine technology is basically using an activated uh, vaccine, vaccine, which is getting a bacteria. Here we're just showing a generic uh, bacteria. This is not uh, by any means Mycobacterium paratuberculosis, but we're using it as a model, just a generic bacteria. And you can kill it either by heat treatment or by uh, using some chemicals like formalin and you end up by having uh, a ghost of a bacteria. So basically, if you are successful in making uh, this inactivation or inactivate this uh, very efficiently, you will be able to get uh, the ghost cells of the bacteria, all of the antigen, all of the proteins, but definitely they are not able to divide, they are not able to replicate. So which is a huge disadvantage of inactivated vaccine. But on the other hand, when you use a live attenuated strain, you are basically, you have the full potential of the bacteria, it's live and it's able to replicate. You just engineer the bacteria to remove some of the uh, genes that they are important for survival of the bacteria inside the host. They are important for virulence. And then after that, you, I'm trying to use, okay. Yep. And then after that, you still have the uh, bacteria that are able to replicate. Once you vaccinate the animal, it can go to the lymphatic tissues like the wild type strain and elicit a strong immune response. What this live attenuated strain will not do will not turn into full blown infection. And that's a very important uh, aspect that we always test for when we look at the vaccine safety and vaccine efficiency. So definitely we go through several tests before we uh, allow it to use this vaccine in the field or use it in, in, the, in animals. So, in, in a nutshell, uh, the advantages of using uh, live attenuated strain that uh, they, are, they have a stronger and more potent immune response because they are able to replicate, they are able to replicate to certain time 
into in in in, uh, in, in animals. Uh, in some uh, models, you can replicate up to the whole time of the experiment of the experiment that we used so far, uh, but at the same time not able to cause a disease, which is really uh, an important uh, phenotype here. Uh, another thing that uh, we are always look for, and we're still testing to find out if our vaccine going to be do this or not, is eliminate shedding. Because once you shed mycobacteria in feces, you actually have a chance to infect new animals, and that's really a bad uh, phenotype, and we're trying to get rid of this feature, because uh, even if we have infected animals, we can test them and eliminate them uh, by when once we, they are positive. But uh, if you continue shedding, they will always uh, co constitute a risk to the rest of the animals. So one of the requirements of developing a new vaccine is basically getting a vaccine that prevent shedding of, uh, of, of, of the disease of mycobacterium paratuberculosis in the feces of the animal. Uh, I forgot to tell you about that the uh, uh, inactivated strain, the current licensed vaccine, comes with uh, a big drawback that it is oil paste, which means that you put an adjuvant, this adjuvant is paraffin oil, and by nature, when you inject animals subcutaneously with this, uh, with this uh, paraffin oil, you will get a, a, a huge accumulation of immune cells. You need this, but you need you don't need them to linger for a long time and cause a granuloma and cause a very unsightly uh, effect on these animals. Uh, this huge granuloma can be a problem later on, and especially when you are uh, slaughtering these animals and you have to condemn the part of your carcass. Uh, but also, in some very few cases, you get some this granuloma infected, and you get some other bacteria, and you have to do some uh, interventions here. So, and the most uh, important, and, and, and using live attenuated strain definitely will help you not use this oil adjuvant, which make you uh, definitely uh, reduce the chances of causing this granuloma and significantly eliminate the problem of uh, having this unsightly granuloma in animals that they live with it for the rest of their life. Um, so far, we have seen, we have shown in, in a couple of animal models that our vaccines are very protective. They can prevent the infection from spreading and can prevent the infection from spreading from organ to organ and can limit the infection to only certain organs. Uh, what we are doing right now is basically this experiment in comparison to the uh, vaccinated, to, to, to the current vaccine to current uh, licensed vaccine, and uh, if you look around it and you'll find out that in a few farmers that I visit myself, that they're using the current vaccine, but at the same time vaccinated animals, you see the granuloma, which means that they got the vaccine, they got the, f the full dose of the vaccine, but they still have infection with para-TB. So lots of farms now, they opted not to use this current vaccine, which make a leeway for us to uh, develop uh, or commercialize our vaccine into uh, into the market and try to uh, help farmers to control this infection. So, uh, research and development usually is a long process. Uh, we started by doing some bench work and we did identify several mutants. Now we are working on a couple of mutants that they have very promising lead uh, to be a good vaccine candidate. We test them in, in, in the mouse model, and we showed that we published this already, that they are really very successful in controlling the infection. And now we're doing some experiment in goats. Uh, we're using a subcutaneous inoculation of, uh, of vaccines and challenging with uh, oral routes, the natural routes. So we're trying to use uh, conditions that's very similar to what you would use in the farm. Uh, you vaccinate usually in the farm using this uh, subcutaneous injection. We found out that all other uh, routes of vaccination could be problematic from a regulatory point of view and very hard to uh, 
uh, control. So that's why we focusing on subcutaneous inoculation. But when we challenge these animals, we challenge them orally because this is also what they usually get uh, in during natural infection. And uh, we ram them with lots of bacteria, so we have very stringent conditions to make sure that our vaccine works. So far, we, the experiment is still going on. Um, we don't have the final data yet, but all of the results we're showing regarding uh, elicitation of uh, immune response, uh, same date immunity, human immunity, our vaccine is meeting all of these benchmarks. So definitely, it uh, seems like we have a very good uh, vaccine candidate that they will be able to control units, but without having this uh, problems with uh, granuloma formation and also being more efficient, more effective than the current vaccine. Uh, what we're doing right in the next couple of uh, years will be working on efficacy studies and safety studies. Uh, we have shown so far that these vaccines are very safe to administer uh, in the current formula and the current way we put this vaccine together. Uh, we haven't seen any untoward effects while the current vaccine have this uh, problem in goats and showing this granuloma that persists for a long time now, up to six months now after the vaccination. Uh, we also have to do some experiment with, uh, with calves. Uh, the calf model is uh, becoming one of the leading models to test uh, vaccine efficacy for unit disease. Uh, in our community, we are debating um, which vaccine, to, which model to use, the calf model, the goat model. We are all in agreement that both of them contribute significantly to the vaccine testing, uh, but there are certain aspects you can test easily in goats, while other aspects you really need to do it in the calf model. And definitely, we are funded from uh, USDA to do this vaccine testing in, uh, in both goats and, and calves. So we're going to be busy in the next uh, couple of years working on this. Uh, this cannot go without definitely putting together a help or, uh, I mean, getting help and putting together a team that can work in, in both aspects, uh, research and development and commercialization. And uh, I reached around to look for somebody to help me with commercialization. And I was lucky to have our president here, Jan Sambrock, who has some experience with um, in the animal space and able to uh, work before in, uh, in companies that market uh, to dairy farms and to uh, throughout the world. So definitely, this was a good fit for us. And that's why we worked hard to get him on board. And I'm glad that he's here. And I think uh, in the next half of this uh, webinar, he can uh, give us some more ideas about uh, commercialization and what we're doing in order to move this technology from just uh, uh, academic exercise in the lab into uh, an actual product that can benefit uh, dairy farms, and uh, we're working on both vaccine and also a diagnostic test that differentiate infected from vaccinated animals. I did not have time to talk about this, but we're definitely working on both because we think that they go hand in hand. And with that, I I will stop here, and I think uh, John from Michigan might have some. Uh, I think. Uh, this break questions. Okay, so I'm going to just pop these uh, questions up real quick. This is uh, uh, you kind of for fun, but also to get uh, a little bit of audi audience participation. So if you'll take a minute and, and answer our questions, it's also a, a good review for um, what we've uh, what we've just heard uh, uh, Dr. Tellot talk about. So we'll uh, give you about um, 30 seconds or so to 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 try your luck and see how you do on the uh, on the questions. And don't be shy and don't worry about uh, about being wrong. I'm lucky because I've got my cheat sheet here, so.
about another another 15 seconds or so and I'll go ahead and broadcast what we got I think just about everybody's gotten done with the first one so I'll pop that up um, and uh, definitely got a, a good majority to get the right answer the answer was C for the first question uh, for the second question, we'll go ahead and broadcast these results. The uh, the right answer was uh, B. And uh, for the last question, uh, give that one the last person a second to jump in there. Okay, and I'll broadcast those results. And the uh, the right answer for that one is uh, is, is A true. So let me uh, hide these, and then I'm going to hand this back off to uh, to John and let him talk about the commercialization side in the second part of the uh, the presentation. Uh, go ahead, John. It's all yours. Right, thanks, John. You have, uh, John, do I have you? Okay. Great. Thanks, John. Um, and thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I've got, I've got yeah, your, can I've got, you. Can you hear me okay? I've, <laughs> I've got your audio. Sorry, I'm having a few technical challenges, so trying to fix things on the fly here. Uh, good. Great, great. Um, so, excellent. So, thanks, thanks again, and um, thanks to Ardell. I think that gives what we're trying to do this morning is give you a, a, an overview of where the science has evolved from, in terms of uh, solving the the Yoni's disease challenge in industry. Uh, and really, what we're trying to do is find where, um, from a commercialization standpoint, find where that uh, that need in the market meets with the uh, the technology being developed in in the lab and I think uh, this is a this is a good example of where uh, we're taking that that research and development work that Ardell's been slaving away over for so many years here to try and understand this organism and uh, and try and really get to the point where we can uh, achieve what we want to achieve to solve that problem to combat that disease and really marrying that with uh, the creation of uh, a business infrastructure that allows that, that product to become a reality for farmers. Um, so it's taking that and getting it into the hands of those people that actually need it. And that is, that's really the, 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 the central theme of what commercialization is really all about. Um, and that's why uh, uh, Ardell started uh, pan genome systems in the first place was really to to take that vision to the market um, so you'll see uh, where idea and technology meet commercial opportunity is where we've created pan genome systems so I want to talk a little about um, our commercialization process and what that's looked like for us uh, how that process has really evolved over time um, and it starts at the top here with uh, the work being done in the university lab and and we've been lucky that uh, the University of Wisconsin has a, a fantastic uh, scientific pedigree, a fantastic faculty full of really uh, 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 genius uh, uh, researchers doing great work here and uh, through a lot of that work ideas are formed and those ideas are then uh, start to get tested in the in the traditional uh, research framework uh, where they're done in labs um, and the idea is to find out whether uh, that there is that solution to the problem uh, then the second phase of the commercialization development is how does that how does that technology then that's been developed that idea how does that come make its way out of the university setting and out of the university research lab uh, and into a, an environment where it can be commercialized and that's where here uh, at the UW we have an organization called uh, the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation or WARF for short and that's essentially the tech transfer office here uh, for the university system so uh, they do a lot to support uh, bringing that idea out of the lab because they, uh, they help to uh, build intellectual property protection uh, that's so important to commercialization of, of technology ideas uh, and they also provide that sort of conduit for the, the technology to make its way out of, of the university uh, and then 
so what we've been able to do is uh, is license the technology out of the university system through WARF uh, and into pangenome systems and so here we are in pangenome systems now uh, and you'll see on the on the right hand side this is a, a picture of uh, some of the GOAT trials we have underway at this point in time um, but really it, so what uh, what we're doing now is we're creating pangenome systems and a, and a business infrastructure to support the commercialization of that idea and to deliver on uh, the the uh, intellectual property that we've uh, we've brought out of the university system uh, and really so uh, on top of that it's not just about the technology then at that point we're also um, in the in the situation where we start to need to develop commercial partnerships and other commercial support for the activities that we're doing and we've been lucky here's just a just a sprinkling of some of the, the key agencies that have really at a very early point in our development at pan genome systems uh, have supported our activities both with kind of uh, financial resources but also uh, with uh, expertise and support to develop business models to develop commercialization plans to develop some of those strategic plans and budgets that we need to really uh, uh, make a plan for going forward and getting the, the technology commercialized so it's really um, creating those corporate structures to sh and, and then shifting the focus of the the testing that we're doing at the same time so it's really taking uh, what was what was research in a in a university lab to uh, research with a real commercial outcome focus to it so for for example for us um, you know to get our vaccine product into the market uh, it needs to be approved through the the USDA uh, uh, animal health uh, department basically they, they provide that that uh, regulatory approval that we we need to commercially sell a product and so we have to map out a strategy to demonstrate to them uh, that our product is what it's what we say it is that it is effective in dealing with the disease that we're targeting that it is safe to use uh, and that it and that it provides the outcomes that that we expect of it um, and that that process is slightly different to a more a discovery focused scientific process that that's earlier in the phase that happens in the university environment uh, so now we're at a, in a commercialization process uh, it's really changing the focus of our research and trials to uh, to target that end goal which is to get the the product to market and that's a slightly different process um, and as I said we've had um, we've had support to date from a number of agencies both at a federal government level uh, with the USDA NEFA um, but also at the state level uh, the with uh, the Wisconsin Economic Development Agency uh, uh, WEDC it's called uh, here they've been really helpful um, also plenty of support through the uh, research processes through the SBIR uh, program uh, that's been really uh, supportive but also more locally uh, industry groups and uh, local investment networks and uh, local angel investors you know um, that's really taking a, taking this process for us to the next phase of development um, so just want to uh, mention those things as, as key kind of components of our commercialization strategy as we look to bring uh, those resources together to get the product into market so just want to run through briefly uh, our, an overview of the sort of time scale for our commercialization process um, we uh, have several distinct kind of milestones along that process uh, that will really both be kind of important points of validation for our technology and the efficiency and effectiveness of our product uh, but they're also critical milestones because they're also value creation points for the company because those are points at which uh, we'll be delivering things and showing things and demonstrating things that are actually worth something uh, so you'll see here uh, starting on the top left hand side 
you know there are several parts to the product testing and validation work that we need to go through uh, within that product development and regulatory approval process and they include some of the efficacy studies that we have underway and there'll be more of that work to do as as Dr. Talat uh, mentioned and also safety work to go alongside that uh, and those studies get have to be done in various environments and in various ways in order to meet the, or to meet with uh, the satisfaction of the USDA approval process and then there's also a step of production validation uh, in that wrapped up in that product testing and validation that's also a really important step because that's demonstrating that we can actually produce the product at a commercial uh, scale and in a, in a commercial way that will actually mean we can get it out of uh, a lab and into the hands of farmers at, at commercial scale as required. So it takes a bit of uh, testing and work to, uh, to, to get that process working smoothly and to ramp up production from producing very small quantities that we need to do the validation work uh, up into the commercial category where we can mass produce uh, this vaccine uh, to, to distribute much more widely. Uh, so secondly then there's a uh, commercial manufacturing and scale up process which is really uh, following on from that production validation process taking <coughs> taking the volumes and uh, really uh, really pushing those up uh, to the point where we can start to enter the market. Uh, then there's a process you'll see around uh, year th the end of year three is our anticipated broad scale timeline at this point um, to get through their USDA APHIS approval process and that's really a key milestone there uh, and, and a line in the sand where we'll both uh, have sufficient data to uh, prove the efficacy and safety of the product but also uh, be able to commence commercial sales uh, and then there's the sales and marketing activities that happen around that so if we're going to start selling something we've got to actually start marketing uh, the product to people who want to buy it uh, and really there's some initial work to do prior to that approval process to to pave the way for that those initial sales uh, and then there's the once we're in the market actually getting in there and competing and and gaining market share so next I want to talk about some of the uh, addressable market this is some of the commercialization work we we need to do here is to really understand what the potential of the business is uh, and outlining what that addressable market looks like is a key part of that uh, and for us we have a, a primary target in the dairy industry uh, as touched on before uh, and that's because the this Yoni's disease is a key problem for the dairy industry uh, and we estimate that market globally to be in the ballpark of between 280 and 360 million dollar addressable market per year for us. So that's potential uh, Yoni's disease vaccine sales uh, globally. And as you can see, there's uh, by the map the um, the distribution of that market is largely reflective of where dairy production centres are. Uh, there are very well established dairy markets in the US, in uh, Europe and in New Zealand and Australia uh, but there are also large and emerging dairy markets in uh, both South America and Asia. Uh, so those are really where we're starting to uh, look at our potential uh, customer base being. Uh, but also secondarily there are several other uh, animals that are also affected by Yoni's disease and uh, th those are also potential markets for us. Uh, although our primary market going uh, going in is the dairy industry and dairy cattle, uh, also beef cattle, sheep, goats, camels uh, are all affected by this disease and so there's potential for our vaccine product to be effective in those markets also and by our initial calculations that market could potentially be worth somewhere in the ballpark of 500 million dollars per year uh, in addition to the dairy market. <clears throat> so this slide is really trying to give you a sense for our business model 
uh, and it's important for us to really, as we try and commercialize, uh, commercialize the technology, is understand how we make money in that process. And uh, this is this is our business model as we're developing it. Uh, essentially, Pangen owns systems here at the uh, at the top center, and we're working with a contract manufacturer to uh, contract the uh, manufacture and production of the vaccine at scale. Uh, and then we'll filter that process, we'll push that product out of uh, our warehouse and into the hands of a distribution network. And we see uh, it being important to partner with uh, other organizations in the sales and distribution area because from a commercial standpoint, it just doesn't make any sense for us to replicate the, the sales and marketing capabilities of those organizations at the scale that we need it. Uh, so our plan is to partner with one or several of, of uh, those sorts of distributors, people that can get us access into key dairy markets and also those that really understand uh, the vaccine space and understand what it means to provide uh, those effective solutions to, to the end users. And that's the veterinarians and the, and the farmers, so people administering and using the vaccine on the ground and in the farm. And we've had several uh, conversations already uh, with a number of partners here, both on the manufacturing side and on the distributor uh, side. And uh, we're really looking for that to create a business model that delivers that credibility in the marketplace and also a, a, a solid supply chain. So when I talk to people a little about the competition that we face, uh, this is it, there's really two ways to understand the competition uh, in the Yoni's disease space, uh, vaccine space. One is that when a farmer has uh, Yoni's disease on their farm, they identify that they have a problem with the disease. They can they can effectively take two routes. One is they can look to eliminate the disease, and vaccination is really the only practical available route to do that at this point in time. Uh, or they can uh, alternatively choose to try and manage the impact of the disease and that's really to just try and stop it from spreading and getting any worse than it already is. And unfortunately you can see here that uh, only 5% of US dairy farmers currently are choosing their vaccination route and that's a reflection of the, the poor performance of the current vaccine uh, that's available in, in the market at the moment. And really we've got 95% of farmers choosing to just try and hold on and, and reduce the effect of the disease as much as they can uh, through hygiene practices or separating uh, newborn calves to try and prevent infection. Uh, so that's a, that's a big equation for us because uh, we really see the opportunity in getting that 5% vaccinating up significantly to more like the comparative kind of process for other diseases where vaccination is used. So we'd like to see that percentage up in the 50% kind of category or better uh, if we can really, and because then we will really be making a dent in this issue. Uh, and as you can see the, the five key criteria that farmers and vets are using uh, when they assess whether to, to use vaccines or not. Uh, and the, the slide hasn't shown up the checks uh, here, unfortunately, they've got lost in the wash. But our vaccine, uh, we're aiming to check all of those boxes, uh, whereas our competitor vaccine really doesn't. Uh, and so the point of difference really I'm trying to demonstrate here is, is the effectiveness of our vaccine to address those issues. And, uh, and we want to make our vaccine available to every single dairy farmer in the country uh, and beyond. And that is, that's not a reality at this point because of the regulatory restrictions. So I mentioned a little about the, uh, the intellectual property that uh, underpins our technology and licensing that uh, out of the university system. Uh, we're building, uh, uh, always looking to build our intellectual property uh, portfolio. But really um, at the moment there are several key patents that underpin our technology and they really circle around the vaccine candidates, uh, the use of global gene regulators uh, and also RNA biomarkers for, for diagnosis of the, the microbacterial infections 
uh, those are the, really the three key categories that we have of, around our IP at this point. But as I said, intellectual property is a really important factor to value uh, here for us. And we really want to make sure that we have the right team to deliver on our promises here of commercializing the technology. And uh, at the moment, our key management team is uh, Dr. Talat and myself, uh, bring, bringing both a, a mix of the deep scientific understanding of this organism and how uh, the technology works, but also uh, real real time commercial experience doing this sort of thing over again, over and over again before. Uh, experience in the global uh, animal health marketplace and also uh, owning and running animal health disease control and diagnostics businesses. So it's really the combination of those couple of skills that are really important to getting us up and going. Uh, we're also uh, lucky to have a really high caliber board of directors uh, uh, and advisors around around pangenome systems and that includes Dr. Michael Collins uh, a uh, real giant in this field and the ex-president of the International Association of Paratuberculosis. And uh, if he hasn't been at, at this issue longer than Dr. Talat, then, uh, then I'm telling lies. He's, uh, he's a real giant there. But we've also looked to build out our, fill out our advisory capability with uh, deep biotech and, and uh, animal pharmaceutical and, and human pharmaceutical and vaccine kind of capability. And we're lucky to have Dr. Bill Chekovic and uh, Paul Radspinner, who are both uh, seasoned entrepreneurs with, uh, with a lot of experience in this area, uh, really building and growing companies based on technology. So with that, it's kind of, that's sort of the quick tour of our commercialization process. Um, we feel uh, very confident that there, there's a huge opportunity to take what we see is really cutting edge science out of the, the, the lab and into the hands of those that really need it. Um, we see a huge problem in Yoni's disease and one that, that really just hasn't been addressed effectively to date. Um, but it's important for us as we go, as we move forward with that vision to really be thorough about building the right infrastructure to do that and building the right support team around that to make it a reality. So I'd, I'd welcome any questions and uh, discussion we have. I think we have a few minutes here at the end. Uh, and I'll hand back over to uh, John to, to lead that process. Uh, but really just to, uh, want you to understand how excited we are about this, this uh, solution. And um, also we've been just recognized that we've been really lucky to, to get to where we have okay, I'm so gonna far. I'm going to make a little um, with a screen lot of flash support. here. We're going to modify the setup uh, just so a little bit. Um, and so it gives us a, a chance to see the question uh, box a little more clearly. So if uh, you'll take a, take a couple of minutes and, uh, you know, kind of think about the, the presentation and your questions and uh, start putting those in the chat box, I'm going to ask the questions one at a time. And so we've got uh, a couple in here already. Um, I think I'm going to skip down from uh, Cecil's question and jump here to, to Jeremy's question. Uh, and he asks, um, is there a difference in the uh, prevalence of Yonas disease in different countries? So we saw that map with the uh, with kind of the market stuff. Um, is there a difference in the uh, prevalence? Yes, uh, definitely. Uh, some countries you have very little prevalence, and uh, even in some parts of Australia, for example, you have some uh, Yonas disease areas uh, that Yonas disease free areas, and others that they have the infection. So it, it depends on the country and the history and the practices. I have some uh, work in, uh, in the Middle East where I saw some countries have between 30 and 40 percent in her level and other countries have about 5 percent. And other countries have like about uh, very similar uh, to what we have here in the United States, about 90 percent. So it all depends on um, management practices. And also, if you always uh, depend on importing uh, dairy animals from, uh, from outside the country, we found out there is a close association between uh, being an open herd, means that you can always import animals and getting animals to your herd, versus closed herd where they basically 
maintain uh, their own animals and keep them and uh, increase uh, the health size from the birds coming out from the same herd. So there are definitely variations uh, depending on the country and the management practices and the history of units in this country. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, the next question, uh, will this vaccine be available for the organic market? So that's a great question. Uh, I, ha I don't see any problem of, of, of using this vaccine in the organic market. Uh, I have uh, a little bit of uh, exposure, uh, just general knowledge about what uh, organic uh, food really mean. So I really don't, I'm just looking at the vaccine formula and vaccine uh, components. I don't see anything that will violate the, the organic uh, product or, or guidelines to having uh, an organic product. So I think it would be definitely available for the organic market. Okay. John, I think this next question may be uh, directed kind of more towards uh, your side. Um, your market estimates are based on retail, but your business model appears to rely on wholesale or larger distributors. Uh, how can you reconcile this? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. And um, as, as I tried to allude to, you know, the, some of those commercial relationships for us are in development. So I... You're right, the uh, market data that I've given you there is at the retail level and obviously if we're using a distributor model then distributors will be taking a piece of that um, as they need to. And uh, I don't want to, I can't really preempt what the commercial terms of those relationships will end up looking like. Um, but obviously those, the, the benefits there will be, will be shared by those participating in that supply chain. And, uh, and obviously, Pangenome Systems, from our end, uh, we, we want to try and retain as much of that value as possible, uh, but recognizing the value that's being added by those distributors within that process. OK, thank you for that. Um, so next question, uh, how soon uh, estimated do you think you're going to have a vaccine available based on uh, what you're currently working on? Do you have a, a kind of a, a, a specific timeline when this new vaccine might be available? If you, if, if you know me, definitely it's not soon enough. Uh, the problem is that the nature of the disease and the models take a long time. And uh, just, to grow the, just to give an example, to grow the bacteria in a petri dish, take between six and eight weeks. So it's definitely, it's a very slow growing organism which make, which makes uh, licensing and getting the work done in order to license this vaccine is also longer. So I think in between, to be optimistic between three and, three and four years will be a uh, good time frame to see this in the market. Which by the way, compared to Lots of other human vaccines, this is very short. Uh, I would like to do it faster, but knowing what we know about the organism and also the regulatory specs, uh, regulatory steps that uh, is going to be taken, so I think we will end up by uh, waiting for about three to four years to get this vaccine to the market. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, okay, next question. Uh, how long, and so I think this is uh, related to the uh, actual, I guess the, the way the vaccine's gonna work. How long uh, would it take before a farmer sees an improvement on the animal that has been vaccinated? So can you describe that process a little bit? Well, um, th that's a good question. And uh, it, uh, it depends on uh, definitely the performance of the vaccine. In our case, we think the vaccine will be very protective from early on, from the start of the vaccination. So we will be covering the uh, animals that they are vaccinated, once they are vaccinated, uh, up to their uh, two or three years where we think that this immune uh, response will be dwindling down. So and the farmers will see improvement in the new animals that they are getting into the herd. Uh, all, so far, we haven't done any experiment to show that we can vaccinate older animals and get protection. Uh, it's, it's a logistic, 
I would love to do this experiment, but um, uh, I cannot do this right now uh, for technical reasons and regulatory reasons. So uh, we think that the improvement will be seen over time once the new animals get introduced to the herd. And that's where you can see the biggest impact. Uh, definitely, when you reduce the number of infected animals, the overall herd do, will improve. But uh, I'm not expecting to see improvement on animals that have been three or four years already in the herd, and they are going through the production cycle and not being vaccinated. I think uh, you're not going to see improvement here. But you see improvement in the new animals, and um, unless we able to vaccinate older animals, I, I think that the improvement would be only in the new animals. Okay, thank you for that. So uh, the next question, uh, for, I guess for clarification, uh, I want to make sure the uh, vaccine isn't going to interfere with uh, uh, the TB test. Yes, uh, that's a very also another very good question. And uh, because our vaccine is genetically modified uh, organism, which means that we, we introduce a mutation in the vaccine and we know which gene has been mutated, we will be able to develop a diagnostic test that can differentiate between this vaccine strain and wild type strains, number one, of mycobacteria. But also we'll be able to identify differences of, of, of in, in, in this vaccine strain from the M. mycobacterium bovis, which is causing the uh, causing the uh, uh, bovine tuberculosis. So, using uh, genomics and uh, what we know in in animal immunology, we will be able to differentiate. And we have some we are already working on a couple of ideas to do this in order to differentiate between the vaccine and infection, and also the vaccine and infection with M. bovis. Okay, um, so a, a follow-up question uh, to one just a, uh, just a little bit earlier, um, and it's about uh, when to give the vaccine. So are you, the question is, is will you only give the vaccine to calves, or is it potentially going to help older heifers or cows? Yeah, right now we are focusing on the calves because um, uh, that, that we think that uh, all we know so far is that the critical time point is the early uh, life, uh, early few days of the life of the of the calf. So if we can protect the animals during this early time points, we will be good for the rest of the uh, of the production seasons or production of, of the, the life of the animal. So this is the focus right now. But there are some. Uh, new data suggests that animals can get infected uh, later on in life, uh, but in order to make this claim, we need to do the experiment. We haven't done experiment to show that uh, vaccine will be effective when you give it a later time point. Uh, but knowing that that vaccination time in animals, usually in the, in the early days, and also the nature of the disease, uh, so we are focusing on the early time uh, of, of the, uh, the time life of the animal. We talk about in the first uh, couple of months of life. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so the next question: uh, Does the vaccine have a waiting period for the the meat or meat, meat or milk? I think this is more of a maybe a production question. So, uh, if I'm uh, kind of reading what the question's asking right, is there a, a kind of a, a time period, a, a waiting period before you can actually process any meat or, uh, or or milk from the animal? That's also a very good question. Um, and all of our shedding studies so far uh, been done in goats and uh, showed that uh, this animal, this vaccine does not shed in feces or, sh or saliva of these animals. We are able to detect DNA, which means that the bacteria is able to replicate, but not really able to shed as a detectable level, so you can see colony forming units. So, and this is only during the uh, very early uh, few uh, days after vaccination, which has been given uh, in the first six weeks of life. So this is not definitely a time where you collect any milk or process meat. Uh, so, so far, 
we don't think that there's going to be a problem at all because we give the vaccine early on in life and so far the vaccine is not not been shown to be shed in the feces or in the saliva or present in the blood of this uh, vaccinated animals we do this as part of the uh, safety or evaluating the safety of the vaccine but uh, definitely this data can be also used to see uh, the withdrawal, withdrawal time i think the the question I was talking about, uh, and usually in, in drugs, there is always a withdrawal time. There is a time need to be lapsed between uh, giving the drug and allowing this uh, food or, uh, or meat or milk to be given to the public. Uh, I don't think there's going to be a problem in our case here. Okay, um, thank you for that. The uh, next question, would this uh, vaccine be helpful in adult goats that are not infected with uh, Yonas disease? Uh, then in parentheses, the point out that they test negative. Um, I, mean, I mean, test negative for Yonas disease means that you want to keep them negative, right? So it will help in this case. And all of our development is done uh, uh, primarily in uh, in goats, or our testing will be done in goats and then done in uh, in calves. So we think that definitely will help goats and sheep. Uh, but uh, I am not really understanding the question. Yeah, yeah, they are negative for units, and we would like them to continue to be negative for units. So they will be, we would be definitely helpful for that. Okay, maybe uh, if we get some clarification on the specific question. So yeah. while uh, uh, looks like we've got maybe another question coming in, I've got a I've got a couple of questions. So my my first one is um, I wonder if you would just elaborate a little bit on your experience with the uh, SBIR process, uh, kind of what your effort was, how many tries to be successful, etc. I'm, I'm definitely interested in the in the tech transfer process on this side, and so I'm, I'm wonder if you could expand on your uh, your experience with that just a little bit. Okay, so I think I will handle the SPIR and then Jean can talk about the tech transfer. Um, so for the SPIR, uh, it was actually, it's uh, quite an experience. It's different from application to SPIR program, it's different from traditional uh, grants that we submit to uh, NIH or USDA. Uh, it's a completely different process. I needed the help of an expert in, uh, in uh, doing SPR grants, and I found this very useful. It was phase one, uh, you apply for phase one, and then if you are successful in phase one, you get invited to do phase two. And for phase one, USDA is about $100,000 maximum, and we were lucky that in the first time we applied, we got this uh, grant and it was really a good uh, boost for us to start the company and and uh, run with it. Uh, what I found was this, that there is definitely an emphasis in commercialization. There is also an importance of finding partners that they can take this technology and move to the next stage of commercialization and definitely uh, building a commercialization plan for your product will help you, especially in phase two. So these are the main things that are really different between uh, traditional academic uh, programs or grants and uh, SPR uh, grants. And uh, I found out hiring an expert in, uh, in writing this kind of grants was very useful. Um, they did not write the science, so, but they really were helping us to make the science more palatable from the business point of view and also uh, make us focus more on commercialization and how to really market your product. So I think it was money well spent. Uh, in terms of tech transfer, I think this is definitely fallen the in the lab of our president here, Jean. Jean? Yeah, thanks. I would uh, add, echo those thoughts. I think, um, you know, more and more these days, research institutions are looking to find ways to 
get the, the technology being developed out into industry and into into the hands of those that need it you know and i think there's a real push to find a, an efficient way to make that happen you know um we've, we're very lucky here at the university of wisconsin and that um there's a very well established track record of doing that quite successfully um over you know several decades so um it's a very established mode of of tech transfer um, there is obviously a process of kind of uh, of invention declaration uh, and an intention to commercialize and really pushing that into the realm of the tech transfer office and saying this is something with commercial value uh, and then the, the tech transfer office their responsibility really lies in in finding the right avenue for that that technology to be commercialized, whether that be finding the right partner or finding the right sort of uh, mode of making that happen. And so for us, there was a process of um, of building a good team around that uh, that idea so that we could take the, the technology uh, and commercialize it through the, the tech transfer office uh, and, and demonstrate that we could actually take that idea and turn it into a real real life business but but there's definitely an intention to make that happen there's a desire for uh, research to be applied in the marketplace and that can be a real win-win for everyone um, but it's also something that requires a lot of rigor you know in terms of the analysis of the opportunity but also um, you know there are there are several legal uh, structural legal challenges to overcome as well to make sure that it's the right sort of structure and separation of duties particularly when it's a, a university professor who's uh, effectively starting a business on the side as as uh, dr talat has so that separation of duties between professor versus ceo of of the company um, those become quite important also Okay, thank you for that. So uh, we're pushing our window time-wise real quick. We've got two other questions. The one is a kind of a clarification, then I think we'll wrap up the questions there. But so back on the question regarding the uh, the adult goats. So um, the uh, the adult goats and the herd have always tested negative for Yona's disease, um, and the person's been tested for many years. And so uh, it looks like uh, she'd like to be able to protect the goats. Um, as well as uh, any new kids, uh, the goats are shown, so technically the adults might be exposed to Yonas disease while off the farm. So it looks like, you know, maybe it's the, the animals test negative, um, and is there a way to, uh, uh, to maybe protect those animals, you know, when they go off the, off the farm uh, for show um, with, this, uh, with this vaccine? Yeah, I, I, I think it my, the same answer that I give about the calves will be uh, the same here that the only way we protect them uh, at that stage is for the, the adult goat is to prevent them to, make, to get mixed up with infected animals. And always keep testing and monitoring if they get infected or not, because if you get any uh, infected animal, you need to remove them from the herd. Uh, but for the young goats, uh, once we have this, uh, I mean the kids, I mean the the newly born uh, goats, uh, definitely our vaccine can help them because uh, with good practices, we never advocate that you give our vaccine or any vaccine and it's still doing uh, the same old things where you mix up infected animals and allow shedding to go around and without removing the infected animals and so on. We always have to go have good control and hygienic measures, but also give the vaccine for the kids. Uh, for adults, maybe in goats it will be easier to do this experiment because the lifespan and uh, availability of animals and so on. So I think we, we might do this experiment to see if the vaccine given to adults will be helping them to, from getting the infection. But we, I haven't done the experiment, so I really hate to speculate beyond this at this point. Okay, well, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull the plug here. We're, uh, we're about 15 minutes over our allotted time. So I want to say uh, thank you both to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Talad and to uh, John Sandbrook.
And uh, I'm going to switch over here to this last screen for those of you still with us. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, to take a moment and uh, just look at the, the questions, the poll questions, and uh, uh, please answer those. Um, and again, uh, uh, John uh, Edel, thank you so much for your time, and I really appreciate, uh, appreciate your presentation. Uh, a couple of notes. Uh, one, if you'd like to get an, a link, an emailed link to this actual recording, uh, I'll leave this page up for a while, so go ahead and email me, and I'll uh, be happy to uh, send you a link. Also, um, there will be a, a link to this webinar on the uh, North Central Regional Center for Rural Development, the uh, NCRCRD webpage, and I've got the, uh, the URL for that, that below. So um, as uh, folks are answering these last questions, uh, gentlemen, are there any uh, parting thoughts? I uh, really appreciate uh, you pulling this together. I thank you for inviting us. I uh, appreciate also the audience and their very interesting questions. Uh, definitely they open up some ideas for us that uh, we were not thinking about. And uh, I was really happy that in the earlier uh, slot when you were talking, when you gave a question, you asked about uh, potential uh, hazard to human. And uh, I haven't touched on this, but I found your audience correctly identified that this could be a potential problem for human, and I was happy to see that. Even if it did not talk about it, I did not cover this. So this is definitely an aspect that we worry about. The jury is still out about having a, <coughs> a very direct link between Yonis and Crohn's, but there are very good indications that they could be uh, the same and there is uh, association. So I know that there are some colleagues working on this, and it'll be an interesting few years to see what's going to come after that. But uh, thanks to all of you guys, and I really appreciate the invitation. John, do you have anything you want to add here? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, and uh, we'll wrap this webinar up. Thank you. All righty, thank you.